Hey, what's up guys? Today I'm gonna to be doing another Patreon game analysis. Uh, once a month we invite some of our subscribers to submit annotated games that we then review in YouTube videos uh, like this one. Uh, it's kind of a new project that we're doing. If you're interested, you should check out our Patreon page as we have kind of a limited number of spots available for this. But yeah, for um, today's game, we're going to be looking at a game submitted by one of our longtime uh, members, aka M. Fabian. Here he's playing white against uh, Major Batata. I believe this was a classical game. And uh, yeah, we get a really interesting uh, middle game structure in this one. Uh, the game starts out as a French defense, knight c3, and black goes d takes e4, uh, the Rubinstein variation, knight takes e4, and bishop to d7. Now, this one is known as the Fort Knox variation, and it's one of those lines that's like really, really solid, but ultimately a little bit passive for black. So, you know, you don't find too many takers playing this position. Um, but the, the ones that do play it, it, it seems like they, they really have a, a lot of success with it because it is does lead, lead to a very specific kind of structure that some players um, are really drawn to. So uh, let's see what happens. Uh, I would say the type of position they end up getting is quite interesting and, and how white should approach it I think is going to be quite instructive uh, for viewers. So white develops here very normally, knight f3, bishop d3, uh, black goes knight d7, and then here Mitch goes uh, c3. Now, if I'm not mistaken, I believe this move was recommended uh, by Grandmaster Negi in his uh, really popular uh, E4 series. I know Mitch is a fan of that one, so I think this is where that comes from. Um, I checked the database. I believe nowadays uh, players are often playing castles in this position. And uh, the difference here, in the game we get C3, Knight F6, uh, White takes on F6, Knight takes F6, and plays Bishop to F4. And uh, here black plays something that's very typical for the Fort Knox variation, this move, bishop takes f3, giving up the light squared bishop and then playing c6 and establishing this kind of light square strategy where black gives up the light squared bishop and then follows the so-called Capablanca rule where black tries to put all the pawns on light squares opposite the dark squared bishop. Now we'll come back to um, this position and, and how white I think should approach this one. Um, but comparing it to, let's say, the old main line, which I think players are now returning to, where white just castles here, and on knight f6 plays knight to g3, here the difference, uh, number one, players often push the pawn uh, to c4 and take a little bit more space, uh, fighting for the d5 square. And uh, I think at some point, sooner or later, black does have to take on f3 anyway, and we get a very similar kind of position to what we'll see in the game. The difference being is that we haven't traded off this pair of knights uh, that uh, in the game white goes knight takes f6. And my feeling is that this is actually kind of a nice exchange uh, or a nice difference, a nice distinction for white. If we're going to be playing this position where white has the two bishops, black has super solid structure, I think white does want to keep a pair of knights uh, on the board for, for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, white is playing with a space advantage. Generally, when you have more space, you want to keep more minor pieces on the board. We can clearly see that Black's Knights on d7 and f6 uh, sometimes are going to be bumping into each other, kind of fighting for the same squares. And another reason, I believe it was Magnus who said not too long ago, I can't remember where it was, it might have been like during some commentary or some kind of just um, one-off comment, but he mentioned that when you have the pair of bishops, it's a lot easier to exploit their advantage when you also have a knight uh, on the board. And we do hear some kind of types of rules like this. For instance, you know, when you're playing up the exchange, you should be trying to trade off your opponent's last rook. Um, and I think it, it kind of makes sense in, in this case where white's knight can be really useful um, on the king side. Uh, one plan I, I was just briefly playing around with is uh, rerouting this knight back to e2 and c3 we're gonna kind of help fight for the queen side and yeah like so like a typical uh line that might uh come about here is let's say white starts with rook d1 black plays rook e8 i think this move a3 is useful to throw in uh, intending to push b4 and just taking space uh, on the queen side 
Uh, in general, white should be playing kind of a very slow uh, build-up game where you're just slowly uh, taking up space and looking to actually advance possibly even on both flanks. So here white tries to maybe play b4, maybe even the rook can switch back to b1 uh, one day then push a4, b5, trying to trade off some pawns and open up the position um, for the bishops. Um, and let's say black plays a5, I think this move knight e2 here would be quite interesting, planning to bring the knight to c3. Um, I, I checked this with the engine, it also suggests for white to throw the g-pawn down the board uh, in many variations, which I think is a really interesting uh, idea. And uh, yeah, for example, knight f8, knight c3, this feels like a very, very pleasant position for white with, with lots of possible um, ideas. Of course, d-pawn we have to uh, point out is rarely hanging when white has this bishop takes h7 trick in the position. And from here, white just continues to build up rook fe1, bishop e5, maybe g3, h4, trying to slowly advance on the king side, maybe even g4, g5 at some point. And I, I do kind of like, uh, like this for, for white. Because what we get in the game, we get just a very, very solid position for black, um, where black takes on f3 here and, and goes c6. And uh, this actually happens in, in quite a, a number of openings, where black specifically gives up the light squared bishop, usually via the g4 square, takes on f3, and then sets up pawns on e6 and c6. Um, so here we see it in the French. Uh, the next game I'm going to cover for Mitch, actually, we see black take a very similar approach in the Scandinavian. Um, and we also see it in the Slav defense, uh, specifically in the, the Schlechter Slav, where black plays g6 and puts the bishop on g7. Um, this type of plan to play bishop g4 and bishop takes f3 um, is very, very common there uh, as well. Uh, now, I actually asked on Twitter if there is like a specific name for this kind of opening uh, strategy, because I really didn't know how to describe this one. A few people suggested the term light square strategy, which kind of makes sense to me. Like you give up your light squared bishop, then you just fight uh, on the light squares. And uh, I don't know who exactly to attribute this to. Uh, I know Gadakomsky is well known um, for playing these Slav positions with g6 and giving up the light squared bishop. I feel like he has many, many games where he just puts all his pawns on the light squares and, and is super solid. Uh, in the Scandi, we'll, we'll see a plan that I know is uh, really liked by uh, John Bartholomew, who um, has played this type of thing a lot, where he goes bishop g4, bishop takes f3, and then again sets up all the pawns on the light squares. So this is a type of structure, a type of position that can really come up in many different openings. And um, the tricky thing is that there's not like one set way, as far as I know, to kind of play against this type of strategy. It really depends on the structure and where the pieces are going to be developed. But white does have different plans to kind of choose from. Um, now, taking a look at this game, uh, here Mitch continues with uh, Castle's king side. I think that makes sense. Black plays queen to d5. Uh, and now white goes queen e2, keeping the queens on the board. I think this is definitely a correct decision. If white takes on d5, black plays probably knight takes d5. To me, this position is incredibly solid for black, and I, I don't really see white being able to generate much of an advantage here. The problem is that black will, let's say, put the bishop on f6, for example, and it's, it's going to be very hard for white to ever push c4 to kick this knight out of the center because then the d4 pawn will one day become a serious weakness. The knight will find a square and then black's pieces will simply pile up on the d pawn. And it's important to mention, you know, the drawback of having the two bishops is that, you know, black's knight can attack squares on both colors, whereas white's light squared bishop uh, obviously can only fight on the light squares. So if white ends up with a dark square weakness here by virtue of playing a move like c4, they have to be very careful that they're not just going to lose this pawn one day because, again, black is a dark square bishop and a knight that can attack dark squares. White has potentially one less minor piece uh, that can fight against, um, you know, dark square approach. Um, so white keeps the queens uh, on the board here. And uh, I think, again, this is the, the right thing to do. Black goes bishop to e7. Uh, now Mitch plays bishop to e5. I think this move uh, definitely makes sense. The bishop kind of strengthens white's center here. Um, but quickly, white does go wrong with, with the plan. White plays f3, which I think is not so great, but connected with his next move, which is bishop to e4. And I, I can definitely understand um, white's idea. You know, if black takes on e4, white gets a nice center. I would say that here, honestly, white's advantage does not seem that impressive to me. White has a nice center, but we've traded off a lot of uh, pieces, and 
black can just like very quickly play c5 in this kind of position and i think will uh, slowly but surely equalize um, but that said i don't think black has to take or even should take black plays queen to a5 here uh, white goes queen to d3 g6 and it's very logical what white does here it pushes h4 trying to get something going on the king side uh, but I think the setup is just a little bit too cramped here. Now the engine points out this really nice move knight to d7 and the idea is that it's not only hitting the bishop on e5, it's also hitting the bishop, uh, the pawn on h4 and setting up or creating a threat of f5 uh, to simply trap white's bishop on e4. So this is okay what, what the engine thinks and basically just like a tactical idea. But even from a strategic point of view, uh, it feels like white doesn't really build up uh, much uh, play here and in the game after h4 rook fd8 very natural move queen c2 c5 seems like black uh, has already just equalized and, and getting uh really good play just in uh, on the c file on the d file and against white's position so we'll come back we'll see how the game went let me quickly talk about what i think white um could do here instead there is a couple of different um plans i would say one idea that's uh, again pointed out by the engine is to just play f4 and uh, the move does make logical sense why it wants to play f5 and, and trade pawns not pieces in order to open up uh, the bishops um, it's a little bit scary because you have to make sure that this bishop on e5 doesn't get trapped but f5 is coming quickly and the follow-up here after let's say the natural move g6 is just to go ahead and play g4 um, now to my eyes this feels like a pretty uh, reckless approach it feels very risky to just push the pawns up in front of the king but okay it's hard to argue with uh with stockfish and yeah the idea to just play f5 and blast open the king side certainly uh certainly feels like that's going to pose some problems to black so this is definitely uh, a very re realistic way of playing uh, the position actually one detail i should note here is that on 97 the engine just wants white to go ahead and play bishop to c7 uh, with the point here that now white is uh, hoping to get a tempo against black's queen uh, with like bishop e4 or bishop c4 so black doesn't really have time for um well rook c8 for example bishop c4 and, and black's queen is just in, in big trouble here so that's kind of white's uh, tactical point but yeah this is why you know it's hard to go with the engine lines because the engine just sees these kinds of things very very quickly whereas for a human the play feels very unnatural so to my eyes, uh, a more natural plan would be to play something like a4. And the point here is just to take some space on the queen side and actually just stay very, very flexible. Because it, it's not like black has such a clear plan here. It is difficult for black to play c5 without uh, proper preparation. Because as soon as black plays c5, they open up uh, this diagonal. Um, so, for example, white can push c4 and then take on c5, and then uh, white will have this kind of three versus two majority on the queen side, uh, which I think is going to be pretty nice for white. Um, so, for example, if c5 here, I think white should just go ahead and play rook f d1, black takes on d4, bishop takes d4, and I think this bishop is simply an excellent piece. I think white's light square bishop is now a lot happier that one day this b7 pawn could be a weakness. And I think that white is kind of uh, the one that's on top here with uh, the trade after after c5 because now black's queen side is a lot easier to attack. Any move like b6 is always getting hit with e5. And yeah, in general, I think white just has a very clear advantage. So I played around with some, let's say, sample variations here. For example, let's say black continues as uh, they do in the game with rook c8. I think white should advance e5 and then a6 if, if black allows to continue fighting on the light squares probably black should play a6 here to stop that and then i think white should just continue improving the position so rook fe1 let's say rook fe8 and uh, the long-term plan is to play on the king side now that white has kind of carved out some space on the queen side i think this a5 pawn is actually uh, strategically a really interesting uh, asset for white because I have an instructive line here, if black ever pushes c5, now let's say white plays uh, c4, uh, the queen has to drop back, let's say queen to d8 to, to stay flexible, leaving the d7 square open for the knight. Um, rook e d1, for example. Uh, and after c takes d4, there's a very cute trick here, with bishop takes h7, knight takes h7, rook takes d4. 
and black's queen is again trapped, right? Short on squares, black has to play like bishop to d6 here to like give back the piece. Then white is just totally dominating um, the d file and just has, uh, yeah, strategically monstrous position. Um, the bishop can come to d6 and then white can put the pawn on c5 and yeah, it's doing fantastic. This is just like a sample variation, but it, it kind of shows some of the, the possibilities here for white having already taken a lot of space on the queen side and not giving the queen some of these uh, squares that uh, usually uses. Now, if black just does nothing here, and uh, I think this is actually a really interesting way to analyze these kinds of positions because um, a lot of times when you analyze with the engine, you know, the engine suggests some moves and then there's some, you know, tactical idea, some tactical refutation. Um, but usually when we kind of come up with our own moves, we, we end up, you know, blundering something. For example, knight d7 here might be a very human move, uh, but then c4 just uh, traps the queen uh, on the spot. Right? I think bishop c4 also looks, looks pretty good. Um, but I always like to see, you know, what's the plan if black just sits? And usually that's the strategy for this type of structure is to just kind of sit on the position, not do much. Well, white pushes h4, tries to get h5 in, uh, maybe king g2, rook h1 at some point, maybe even f3, g4. And these two bishops really kind of dominate the, the whole board. They dominate the king side and the center, and it's hard for black to do anything on the queen side as well. And uh, yeah, it seems like white is just having a very, very pleasant uh, position here just hard for black to really do anything to trade off any pieces. You know, on bishop d6, white is usually just taking on f6 here and, and weakening the pawns. Uh, and otherwise, yeah, it's just difficult for black to really um, to really handle this one. And white's play is just very clear. Now that white has kind of set up this grip on the queen side and in the center, now it's time to just slowly push on the king side. All of white's pieces have good mobility. And yeah, black is just kind of sitting um, black could try to play uh, c5 at some point, um, but usually I think white is, you know, very happy to take this one. And uh, let's say rook takes, white can play b4, followed by rook d1, c4, and just continue pushing uh, on the queen side. Of course, we have to make sure not to blunder this pawn, maybe rook to b1 to just kind of continually build up. And with the pawn on c4 taking the d5 square away from black's knight, very difficult for black to really achieve any any kind of meaningful counterplay here. And I think pretty soon black is just going to start to feel um, very, very squeezed. Now I realized actually I might be blundering uh, rook takes e5 here, followed by queen takes d3. So maybe white starts with rook to d1 first to kick black's queen off of the d file and then follows up with b4, c4, uh, and so on. So okay, tactics are always going to be uh, one of the most important things in the position. So that would be my approach to, to this position. Uh, I hope it's an interesting one uh, for you guys that kind of have to deal with the structure. I think it's really more just about the style and the pace of play. My feeling is that you want to just kind of slowly build up on the queen side, keep everything under control, and then one day start pushing on the king side, g3, h4, h5, and, and so on. Now in the game, like I mentioned, black gets a very nice counterplay with c5 here, and uh, even sacrifices some material, but I think 100% uh, correctly. White takes this pawn on b7, and black just goes c takes d4, hitting the bishop on e5. Uh, white takes on f6 here, bishop takes f6, takes the exchange, rook takes c8. And yeah, black has sacrificed a, a full exchange here, doesn't have one pawn yet, but will be taking on c3. And because black structure is so solid here, and white actually has a lot of dark square weaknesses, um, yeah, my feeling is that black is, is not worse at all. I think the engine gives something like equality here, but as we'll see in the game, white ends up going wrong very quickly, and that makes me feel like the, you know, the practical advantage is definitely uh, in black's favor here. So in the game we get c4, queen c5, uh, queen to d3 because d3 check was a big threat. Black does win a pawn on uh, h4, uh, and after rook fd1, bishop to g5, White's position is actually already losing here. The, the bishop is headed to e3, and white's king is just getting completely uh, destroyed on the dark squares. Uh, what white needed to do was keep this rook on the f-file so that he could push f4 and fight against this plan of putting the bishop on e3. This is difficult to figure out during the game, but I, I guess the main, main move white should have been thinking about is something like rook to d1, threatening to take this pawn. Uh, if black plays e5, then white can play f4 try to open up the position, fighting against black structure, 
and uh, something like bishop to g5 with you know bishop e3 check ideas then again f4 bishop f6 b3 and i don't think white is exactly worse here i think white is okay but i also think black is is totally fine as well just full compensation for the exchange very nice blockade that black is going here and again really solid structure you know when you have the extra exchange what your rooks want is they want some targets they want some open files something to actually attack but what can white actually attack in this position it, it seems very very difficult so dynamically probably the position is balanced but yeah honestly i'm not sure who i'd, I'd rather uh, take here i feel like um, black definitely has very decent uh, compensation now the game uh is pretty messy from here on out but after bishop e3 king f1 queen to g5 yeah basically uh White just tries to run away with the king, but black gets um, huge, huge counterplay with the queen and bishop. Now starts taking uh, a bunch of pawns, and yeah, Mitch wasn't really able um, to hold this one. Might have had some some better ways to uh, defend here, but when your king is this weak and black has such a nice grip on the position, it's yeah very difficult to defend uh, in in the long run. Um, so ended up losing this one, but uh, well, I mean, the nice things about game analysis is that you can learn from the game, whether you win or lose. Uh, so <laughs> hopefully this analysis was useful for Mitch and for you guys when you have to deal with kind of um, similar strategies in the opening with black giving up the light square bishop and putting all their pawns on light squares. Uh, in the next one, we'll be seeing another example uh, of this type of uh, strategy this time coming from the Scandinavian uh, and in, in that game we'll see white has to take a completely different approach in my opinion to fight for the advantage um, so hopefully you guys will look forward to that one and also find that one instructive uh, all right guys that's going to wrap it up for this video thanks for tuning in if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet uh, please do so if you enjoy these types of uh, quick game analysis videos please let us know in the comments so we know to do uh, more of them uh, but we ha already have actually a lot more coming so that's probably going to happen whether or not <laughs> people comment uh, anyways thanks for watching and uh, i'll catch you guys next time take care